evening, everybody. Just on behalf of uh, the Water and Environment section in uh, Engineers Ireland, I'd like to welcome JP and Albert Daly, uh, who are giving this evening's talk, uh, A Time for Watch, which is water management in the face of climate change. It's a, a research project that uh, RODIS have been involved with, um, and the TII will give a, an introduction now into why the, the project is important and the, the drivers for it. Uh, just to quickly remind everybody on uh, knocking off your mobile phone or at least switching it to silent and uh, the fire escapes are back the way we came in or the door over to the, the left of the screen. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you very much, Owen. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Engineers Ireland for the opportunity of talking about this project and, and the context within which uh, it's run and also to the water, ma uh, water and Environment Group within Engineers Ireland for the, um, for, for the invitation. Um, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Albert Daly. I look after research and standards for Transport Infrastructure Ireland, uh, the organisation previously known as the National Roads Authority for your information. We went through a change, name change last year uh, whereby we, we uh, combined uh, both the, the road and right, light rail organisations in, in, in Ireland, I'll talk about that a little bit later in the, uh, in the presentation. So I look after research and standards. Uh, my background is in research, in fact, but I joined uh, uh, TII NRA uh, 10 years ago to look after a research program, and now I also look after the standards uh, within which we build and operate all of the national roads within Ireland. And the standards that we develop are also used for the non-national roads as well, because there aren't any other standards in the country. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to give uh, the background of the project um, uh, and the, the, the context, the reasons why we're doing it, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, John Paul Rooney from uh, Ronald Donovan, who is one of the partners within the project, and he'll give you more information on the, on the detail, the structure and the outputs of the, um, of the research project. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of myself and uh, Billy O'Keefe. Billy O'Keefe is in our environmental section within TII, uh, and he's got a special interest in climate change. He's an environmentalist, but he's also a hydrogeologist. He's also an engineer, uh, and he's uh, the person who's actually developing the, that's the climate change strategy for TII, which uh, hopefully will be clear by the time I've finished, uh, finished, finished talking over the next 10 minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the CEDAR research program. You see a lot of acronyms in, the, in these slides. Uh, um, I'll try and explain most of them as I go along. CEDAR is the Conference of European Directors of Roads. Within, uh, within Europe, there are lots of different road authorities. There are 28 of them, in fact. And we get together in a group called CEDAR, the Conference of European Directors of Roads. And it's a, it's a, it's a forum for the exchange, the sharing of information in how we manage uh, and operate our road network. And within, within that organization, there's a special interest in research, and we do carry out research projects, uh, which are co-funded by all the diff different partners, uh, uh, with a specific view to implementation. So these are research projects which are done specifically for road authorities, specifically to help road directors carry out their mandate of managing and operating a safe and efficient network of roads throughout Europe. Um, what I'd also like to talk about, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the research program. I'll then talk about the, the TII strategy on climate change and how we're developing that. And we'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about the resilience of the road network and how we want to develop a road network that can actually respond to extreme weather events, which are, which are coming and have already come because of climate change. And I'll also talk about the impacts of climate change and how we're developing our standards and specifications to take that into res response. Um, and after that then I'll very briefly introduce the project and then JP will take over uh, the actual description of the project itself. I'm hoping to speak for about 10-15 minutes or so and then um, JP will take over the, the, rest of the, um, the rest of the presentation. So first of all I've mentioned the Conference of European Directors of Roads. So this is the forum whereby we get together and exchange information. Within that organisation about nine years ago we decided we would develop a research program. The idea of the research program is to carry out applied research projects which are specifically aimed at the needs of road directorates within Europe. 
The research needs themselves are identified and specified by the road directorates, so we do not we do not go out and solicit ideas from the research community. We develop the ideas. We then put together a, 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 a pool of funding, so each of the research each of the road authorities put together some of their research funds into this pool and then we carry out an open and competitive call for proposals and that's where the research community come in and give us their proposals and all these proposals would then be evaluated and eventually uh, selected and procured by what we call the program executive board for each of the programs that we set up we set up these the first one we carried out in 2008 and since then we've grown we've had an annual call every year and there's a the current call the 2016 call just closed in fact about uh, about a month ago or so and the, the proposals are currently being evaluated by that uh, we in ireland managed three of those uh, research calls over the years I, and I was the program manager for those calls and i'm also the program manager for the 2015 call within which the climate change program and the watch project in particular was procured and that's what we're talking about uh, later on later on I'll mention the word again, implementation. So the focus on all of these projects is implementation. So road directors are willing to pay big bucks, willing to pay lots of money for research provided it satisfies their needs. You're probably aware that there's lots of huge research programs out there, like Horizons 2020 is something like 25 billion over eight years, but they carry out a, a very blue skies, um, tentative type of, type of research. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the, the end of that the application of those research projects. So that's what we're looking for in these research programs. And hopefully you'll see that with the watch program by the time we're, we're finished the presentation. Obviously there's various reasons why we want to carry out research. I don't need to go through them. Everybody should be aware of why we need research, why we need innovation, all of that sort of stuff. But the focus of this program is to promote jointly funded research within the road authorities geared specifically towards the, 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 um, the road authority's needs. In relation to climate change, we've had a number, we've had three programs, in fact, focusing on climate change since we started. The very first program back in 2008 was actually a climate change program, the title of which was Road Owners Get Into Grips With Climate Change. Within that program, we carried out four research projects. These were carried out by various research organisations throughout Europe. And the idea was to look at how road owners, how road administrations can get a handle on dealing with climate change, both from an, from a, uh, from a, an ad adaptation and a mitigation point of view. These were fairly theoretical, but we did actually develop some tools. And in fact, within NRA at the time, TII, we actually took one of those projects, which I'll talk a little bit more about, the Swamp Project, where we looked at how we would deal with the more extreme rain events that we know are going to come because of climate change over the next few decades and indeed have already started we've already seen this in the last three four five years we've had some very extreme flooding events which were in unprecedented a, a clear indication clear evidence of climate change and the effects it has on our um, on our infrastructure in ireland within 2012 we had another another research program and there was two projects on that uh, and they were focusing on looking at the climate change scenarios that the climatologists were telling us were coming, depending on the risk you wanted, low, medium or high. But we wanted to look at those and downscale them to a project level because there's really no point in having a climat climatologist telling us that the temperatures in Ireland are going to go up or down over the next 50 years. There's no point in them telling us the rainfall is going to go up or down over the next whatever number of years. As a road authority, we need to know what that, what that, the implications of that at project level. So what does it mean for the M50? What does it mean for the new scheme that we're developing in, in, in the west of Ireland? That's the, that's the actual project level information that we need. And the current program, which we're on about today, was launched in 2015. Uh, there are three projects, one of which is the WATCH program, and that's the, one, the project, and that's the one that um, JP will talk about in more detail. The idea here was we would take it from desk to road. So now let's forget about the theory, let's forget about the academics, let's even forget about the climatologists and focus on the research that we've developed. How do we take that? How do we implement it? How do we embed it in what we do? How do we embed it in how we build, how we plan, how we design, how we operate uh, our road infrastructure? So that's really what, what, what the whole program is about from a road authority's point of view. So I just want to talk a little bit about the development of a climate change strategy within Transport Infrastructure Ireland. 
and looking at what, the, what, we're, what we've done at the moment and what the future challenges are. This is actually a road scheme in the west of Ireland. It was part of the Gort to Tune bypass, which is uh, under construction and should be opened by the end of this year. Some sections have already opened. This photograph was taken back last November, I think it was, a, a flooding event. Just after the, the road had been more or less, uh, that part of it had been constructed, we got this very severe uh, rain event. So what do we do about it? The questions we need to ask ourselves as road um, operators and, uh, and road infrastructure providers, how resilient is the network to future extreme weather events? How much of this change, how much can we actually take in the way we design uh, our infrastructure at the moment? How will climate change influence these events? So if we continue the way we're going with increased climate change scenarios, what should we be doing now? Because we know that that's going to influence how the road infrastructure behaves over the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years, whatever. And the third question is, how can we take account of these changes and how do we design now, how do we plan our roads now to take into account? And is it achievable in, 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 uh, from any point of view? So that's what we're looking at within the strategy that we have within TII for adapting to climate change. TII is a new organisation. I've been talking about more or less all the time roads up to now. That's my background as well. But we now have to look at, at the light rail infrastructure that we're, that we're also uh, building. And we'll continue to, uh, to build over the next whatever number of decades. What do we need to do? We need to manage the flood events. We need to carry out flood assessment. We need to develop ma management protocols for managing that. We need to create a database of all of the events that have occurred so we can keep a track of what they are, what the trends are, in order to manage the infrastructure going forward. We need to implement effective mitigation measures, not, not just adapting, but also mitigating. So how do we build our infrastructure where we don't make climate change worse in the future? We need to coordinate with the relevant authorities. It's not just ourselves, it's even the education, the tourism, they will all be affected by climate change. But specifically, we need to be able to coordinate with the, with the, uh, the Gordi, the emergency services, even the local authorities when we deviate our traffic off a road because of a flooding event. We need to do all these, we need to take all these things into account. We also need to prevent it in the future, as I mentioned. We need to look at our energy and carbon consumption and how do we assess our projects now to ensure that we don't make climate change even worse over the next uh, few decades. And specifically, we need to develop severe weather management plans. What do we do when these extreme events occur? What, do we ha what happens when we get these flooding events uh, on, the, on the road network? Uh, we've had a few projects, and some of these have, have, have spun off from the European uh, uh, projects that we developed. I mentioned the Swamp Project. It was a European project where we were looking at trying to identify where the flooding events would occur uh, in respect to climate change. We had a project with a consultant called JBA, and they helped us carry out or at least tell us how we should uh, carry out this kind of assessment. They included uh, things like digital terrain mapping. It included things like where the floods are coming from. Uh, it, it, it helped us develop a, 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 a method for determining uh, surface weather maps. So we, we, we impose our road infrastructure on a weather map, on a, on a, on a, on a water, water availability map, to try and determine where, where the critical points are. It was a very detailed project. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but that was the starting point uh, from which we started developing our, our, um, our strategy. Uh, I should mention, and I probably sh should have mentioned it earlier, that in relation to climate change in Ireland and road infrastructure in particular, the, the issue is, is rain. We have a lot of rain in Ireland, uh, and we will continue to get that. What's happening with climate change is the, we're getting the same amount of rainfall, but it's coming in these much more extreme events. So we're getting a lot of it at a very small period of time. And that's actu actually the big issue we have. So a lot of the focus we've had, and you'll see that in, in the watch project as well, is looking at water, what we do with when water comes on the road. And if there's any road engineers around, you know that water and roads don't really mix. The, the big, the, aside from traffic loading, the biggest um, deterioration process we have on our road infrastructure is, is actually water rain falling and rain falling at, at, at extreme times. So what, what this uh, JBA helped us do is develop these flood maps. 
And if you look at the, um, the, the, the uh, this, is a, this is a map of our road infrastructure. And the, this is the map of our road infrastructure. And this is the kind of mo model, this is the kind of output that we, we get from the models. Uh, you can't, I know you can't see it very well, but if you look at it, you'll see the road infrastructure is, uh, is, 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 is highlighted. The red spots are the points at which there will be, there could be a flooding event, or at least it's an area that's prone to, uh, to, to, to a flooding event. Superimposed on that are the blue spots, which are the areas of the land which are, which are prone to flooding. So when we developed these uh, maps, we worked with the local authorities uh, to develop a, flood, a general flood map, not just specifically for roads. We needed to get together with other, with other authorities as well. And that's, that's all part of the overall strategy that we have, not just within TII, but also nationally within, within, within Ireland for, for looking at the effects of um, and how to mitigate against climate change. Um, flood source data, I mean, th there, there are various reasons where, where the flooding comes from. We, we looked at fluvial uh, and pluvial. So we looked at both the rainfall and the, the groundwater and the river systems and the lake systems, because they all contribute to, to, to where the likelihood of flooding events will come from. We've also looked, although not so much because we're not affected by it, the coastal um, sea level data as well, because th that has an effect, although for us, for the roads, it doesn't really have, because most of our roads actually leave the coast as opposed to running, running, running along it. There's a lot of information on, on this that, that we have available, and it's all on our website. If anybody wants any more information, please, please contact us, because I can provide, we can provide a lot of information. Uh, I'm not a climatologist myself, so I'm not going to talk too much about this slide, except to say that there are various models that we can use for predicting what climate change is going to mean for Ireland, or indeed any, any area. And there's various models there. There's lots of acronyms that you can see. They don't, they don't mean anything to me. But th hopefully the WATCH project will uh, end up by putting those together and telling road authorities like ourselves what the best models are, how we can use them to develop research strategy, to develop uh, climate change strategies, and also how we, can use, how we can use them to embed a climate change strategy into the way we operate. So these are the questions. How will climate change influence uh, what we do within our roads. And I'll just, uh, just pick one example, for example, of our drainage and, and road design systems. This is a typical example. Here's a road and there's flooding all over the place. Uh, you know, you can drive around the, the, the Ireland any time of the year and you'll probably see some, something like that. And it is becoming a particular issue because they are becoming more frequent, more common and more extreme. So what are the climate change, what are the climate change uh, projections in relation, to, uh, in relation to the climate in Ireland? We expect to have sh more short duration events, but much more intensely. What does that mean on simple terms from a road design engineer? We need bigger pipes to carry the, w the water away from the roads. What we do with the water after that, we need to take that into account as well. We also need to look at the longer term. So for example, there are seasonal changes and seasonal changes will become more pronounced in our level of climate change. Uh, winter would be more would probably be more, more pronounced than summer, so we're going to get the dry spells, we're going to get the wet spells. And we will certainly be getting the more frequent storm events. So we will be looking at the return periods that we're using at the moment are, are, seem to be way off the mark. We've had about five or six floods in the last three or four years that climatologists are telling us have a return period of over a thousand years. So we, we're, we, we certainly will be getting those more and more into the, into the, um, into the future. So can we take account of these changes? Well, the first thing we need to do is look at the current resilience. So how much climate change can our current infrastructure take uh, in relation to how we're actually designing our roads at the moment? And then what do we need to do with future designs? So how do we take into account these, these uh, future changes in our current standards? Do we continue with current practice of factoring rainfall? At the moment, what we do is we just slap on an extra 20% onto our, onto our rainfall a very crude um, uh, measure that we've been doing now for the last 10 or 15 years when we first recognized that climate change is going to be important. But we do need to do that in a, in a, in a more scientifically, and that is the idea of the research and the, the, uh, and, and the watch project in particular, how we manage uh, and how we do that within our, within our standards and how we embed climate change within the, within the, um, within the, uh, the, the, uh, the design process. Um, 
I won't talk too much about that. I'm going to go on to a particular example. This is a specific. This is a, a standard drawing that we use for our road detail. For anybody, any road engineer, you will recognize what it is. This is the roadway itself, and you can see we would normally have some sort of a concrete channel where we would pipe the water away. So we would take the water off the road and take it away and treat it and do something with it. What we're trying to do now is use more sustainable systems. SUDS has been around for quite a while. We've actually started using SUDS systems over the last few years, and they are probably the most, most, most effective way of dealing with the more extreme events that we're expecting. So we're getting away from the idea of having a concrete curve and gully system, like, like you see in, in, in the picture, and we're going to these more organic systems. So SUDS, uh, Sustainable Urban Drainage Systems, here's a typical example. This is a constructed wetland. So we've designed this on the side of the road to take the water. So instead of taking the water and piping it to a treatment plant and then putting it back into the rivers or the groundwater or whatever, we develop these wetlands, which with the water can be stored there. We will vegetate that with grasses, which can absorb the bad stuff and then let the rest seep away into the, um, into, into the groundwater at a, at a natural level. We can take it away and treat it if we wish as well. Hopefully the watch project will look at those systems that we're using and show us how we can improve them and how they can be used to climate to 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 uh, to, to um, help us with with climate change. Here's another example. This is a grass water channel. So instead of building this concrete channel down down the path with the curve and gully, we'll develop this, which will take the water and and, and take it away. We will grass it again so that the the um, so that the the it's a natural process of purifying the water. Uh, these 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 work but we don't know whether they're going to continue to work in the future. If we have these extreme events that we're predicting, hotter summers, drier summers, as well as the more extreme rainfall events, the grass will die. So we need guidance from the research community as to how best to not just design them and build them, but also how to maintain them going forward. So now we come on to the climate change programs that we're talking about. It's called, so the call was launched in 2015. The, the, it was funded by uh, a few countries, a few CEDAR members within that, including Ireland. And the main objective of this was to embed climate change processes, protocols, into how we design, build, operate, plan our, plan our roads. There were two project, three projects commissioned from the project, one of which is the WATCH project. This is a summary of the WATCH project. Uh, it's focusing on the, on the, um, the, the management of, of water within the context of climate change and how at the end of the project we would hope that the watch project will allow us as a road authority to embed that kind of thinking into how we plan design operate our roads so it was longer than i expected but i'm going to hand over now to uh, to jp and jp is going to talk in more detail about the, about the watch project if anybody's any questions we can take them now or we can take them at the end if there's any quick questions, we'll go straight on then. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Okay, well, thanks very much, Albert, for, for that introduction. Um, so, as Albert pointed out, I'm John Paul Rooney from Rowan and Donovan Consulting Engineers, and uh, we're delighted to be uh, working on this, uh, on this CEDAR project. Um, about 12 months ago, almost to the day, um, I gave a presentation here in Engineers Ireland um, uh, presenting the findings of some research uh, I undertook um, with the help of, uh, with the support of my employer, uh, ROD, um, uh, and that was a master's research uh, degree in Trinity College uh, looking at the uh, barriers and the uh, solutions to the successful implementation of SUDS. Um, and one of the uh, key findings of that piece of research was that you know there was a uh, climate change is a big issue uh, in terms of SUDS and there are uncertainties around climate change as to how do we design for climate change and how are SUDS systems going to perform in the long term. Um, and uh, also, uh, again, one of the key findings was that there's a a lack of, of guidance uh, around um, SUDS and climate change. Um, there's a lack of design standards, um, there's uncertainty uh, in terms of maintenance requirements and the, the long-term performance of SUDS. So um, uh, it's, it's, it, 
wasn't planned, but it's, it's worked out nicely that uh, 12, 12 months later, uh, I think we can talk about um, how we're actually going to address um, these challenges in this, later, in this latest call uh, from CEDAR. So um, just to, in, in, in terms of how the, how the various team members um, uh, operate and, and, and what we all do, I, I won't dwell on these, but, but essentially um, uh, the, the project is, is led by a company called Deltares. Um, they're a knowledge institute um, uh, based in the, the Netherlands, and their speciality is water management um, and, and flood defence. Um, uh, then we have uh, ROD and our sister company, RODIS. RODIS focus on research projects. ROD, we're in the, in the uh, consulting engineering uh, business. So we um, design drainage systems um, uh, and that serve roads and, and, and buildings and, uh, and everything else that goes with it. Uh, we've got Aegis uh, from France. They're a, a road operator. Um, the DRD, the Danish Road Directorate from Denmark, and the Dutch Meteorological Institute. Um, so between these five partners, we all have our various uh, tasks now um, that we perform. And we, we, we were discussing this um, before we started, uh, myself and Albert, and the, and the terminology um, that we use, uh, we, uh, work packages um, is, is, is the terminology um, that we, uh, that's associated with these projects. So each of the participants has a particular expertise and uh, in, in response to this call uh, we, we get together and we have to brainstorm to think about well look what 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 are the funding countries looking for um, and how are we going to answer these questions um, so we're fortunate enough to have uh, a team with I suppose a lot of specialities and, and, and work in different parts of the industry where we can all come together uh, collaborate we're all working on the packages on the various work packages together um, but um, each of us is, is leading uh, distinct work packages uh, in in their own right so in terms of the call from cedar so um, the most important high frequency uh, causes of, of road flooding are it, we're separating them into into two um, parcels we got we're calling it water uh, in the area around the road related to surface water runoff and uh, rainfall on the road itself and and how are we going to deal uh, with that so we're looking at effectively all parts of the drainage um, system serving um, um, serving nra's infrastructure so we're talking about stormwater runoff systems stormwater management facilities like the ones that we, we mentioned earlier on in terms of suds and uh, and attenuation systems um, non-porous and porous pavements. Um, porous pavements are extremely popular in the Netherlands and, and other parts of Europe. We can come on to that later on. Suds, so of course, culverts, carrier pipes, ponds and wetlands. So these are our, our typical um, systems and features um, that we design, construct and maintain um, to serve our, our, our road infrastructure. So what are the objectives? So we are... Um, uh, at the end of all of this, um, as Albert pointed out, um, we, the main outcome uh, of this piece of research is going to be a manual. A manual that's going to be used by designers, um, operators and people who maintain uh, drainage systems in terms of how, w how uh, we should appropriately design for climate change, how these systems should be maintained um, and uh, um, uh, I suppose one of the key elements that we're bringing to it is, is a cost-benefit analysis, uh, which we'll talk about later on. So we're actually going to look at, one, the cost and benefits of designing for climate change um, adaptation, and two, cost-benefit assessments of the various processes uh, and systems that could be um, used and implemented uh, to, to, uh, to um, address these challenges. So um, we're looking at the current and future resilience of the NRA's water management facilities to ensure optimal design, maintenance, and planning um, and asset management. Now, that means we'll be using um, the manual and these processes right from the very beginning um, uh, of, of a roads project. Um, if we leave it to the detailed design stage, it'll, it'll be too late. It, it needs to be embedded in the decision-making process right from the beginning. So we're looking to provide easy, easy access to climate data um, because as, as Albert pointed out, there are a huge amount, there's an awful lot of, in, uh, of research has been done internationally 
uh, in terms of uh, climate models and various predictions of how uh, our weather patterns are going to change, but we need to know how does that impact um, our roads, how does that impact Galway, Kerry, Dublin, um, uh, all different uh, geographic locations, not just in Ireland, but we're talking about across Europe. Um, we we're looking to gain insight in the application of SUDS, both for storage and for treatment. Um, we're looking to uh, have uh, an informed uh, decision-making process for water management supported by a CBA and uh, probably one of the most important uh, par uh, parts of the, uh, of the research is actually the, the demonstration phase where we actually look at case studies and provide evidence that this manual and, and, the, approach and the approach that we're promoting actually works in practice. So in terms of our uh, I'll use the, the dreaded phrase, uh, work packages, <laughs> which uh, uh, Albert tells me is, uh, he's not too keen on. So um, we uh, changed some of the, the text after this. But um, these are the various work packages um, um, that we are, are tackling. So um, at the end, of, you know, so each, each individual package, there is an outcome. There is, there is a document which goes in to, to feed the, the overall manual at the end. So um, we're, we're working on all of these different um, uh, parcels um, at the moment. Um, we're near the end of what we're calling uh, the listening process, where we've been in touch with all of the NRAs across Europe. Um, and we had our, uh, our, our workshop um, in Delft in January, where we met um, members of the, of the funding countries. Uh, we asked them questions. Um, uh, to gain their their insights and their feedback into uh, I suppose the, the challenges they face and I suppose the different approaches that different countries have in terms of how they manage uh, stormwater, how they are addressing the challenges faced by climate change. And um, towards the end, I will just briefly go through some of the findings of this um, of the listening process workshop and the and the country comparison report. Um, that we prepared, because um, there are some parallels with the research that we undertook here uh, in Ireland that we presented last year. So these are the five, oh, sorry, six work packages, um, and uh, I'll, I, I'll, I'll go into uh, more detail uh, now. So in terms of the, of, of the listening process, um, uh, the purpose of this is to, I suppose, just get an understanding of uh, user needs and the current state of practice. Um, what are their what, what what are their guidelines? What are their standards? What is the legislation in these countries? Um, is it something that we can learn from from uh, from that? Um, but also at the end of the day, if we're producing a document that is to be used right across Europe by all the NRAs, um, it has to be able to I suppose address the governance structures in each of these organisations and the, and the legislative framework uh, in which they operate. Um, so uh, the, the funding countries, um, uh, plus a couple of others, but we've, um, we have a country comparison report um, that we're just in the process of finishing off, um, uh, which uh, from countries Germany, the Netherlands, Ireland, the UK, Norway, Sweden, Austria and France. Uh, we're mainly focusing on Northern European countries. Uh, I suppose that the challenges in terms of climate change in Southern European countries are, are kind of different, but we have quite a homogeneous group and we're, um, we're quite happy with that. Uh, so looking at the guidelines that are um, uh, in, in practice and in use in these countries, and we've conducted interviews and questionnaires with them, and we've had our, our listening process workshop, and uh, we'll go through some of the findings at the end. Um, so then in terms of the, of the uh, climatology, um, uh, or climatologists, the Dutch Meteorological Institute, who are, I suppose, a world leader in this field, and again, I am not a climatologist, um, but there are lots of different um, um, models and methods uh, that can be used. But effectively, what we're looking to do um, is to produce in this manual uh, guidance as to what are the appropriate climate models to use for different scenarios and how to use them and how to apply them. And it needs to be clear, it needs to be transparent. Uh, there is an awful lot of research that's been done in the past, and I suppose we're conscious that the main focus um, of this call is that, is that at the end of it, and in fairness, um, Albert and Billy have been very clear about this in the outset, at the end of it, the intention here is that the standards will be changed. Um, and the standards need to be changed to reflect um, uh, uh, 
the challenges that are being faced uh, by the NRA in terms of climate change. Um, so these are the, the, the different methods um, for, for scaling runoff. Um, you know, IDF curves, we use IDF curves in our own uh, drainage designs, but if we compare our own IDF curves, some of the IDF curves um, that are used in European countries are a completely different shape and the rainfall intensities are very different. Um, uh, we use statistical analysis and then we have smaller catchments and simple hydraulic models and other methods also. So uh, the manual will, will have guidance on, on which is the best methodology to use and how to apply it. Um, uh, so in terms of, of climate analogues, uh, really what we're looking at is um, uh, so one of the, it, it's quite a simple and, and powerful tool, but effectively you, you look at regions um, in the world which are expected, you know, to have, um, in the future you will have a similar climate to the, um, the climate these countries are facing now. Um, so it's quite a quick way of looking at um, uh, uh, various climate scenarios and how we can address them. Uh, so coming on to um, SUDS, this is the, uh, the work package that is, um, is being led by, uh, by ROD, obviously with, with in, uh, input from all the other members, but effectively the, uh, the, the objective of, of this, uh, as Billy pointed out, is just to assess, well, what is the resilience of SUDS to, to climate change? And um, we know that, I suppose, SUDS has been touted as... Um, the answer to nearly all of our drainage needs. Um, now, I'm, I'd be, a, um, I suppose, um, an advocate of SUDS myself, but I one, of the, one, of the, one of the things that we're going to look at here is, well, look at, you know, in the short term and in the, term and in the, and in the, the long term and, and undertaking appropriate cost-benefit analysis, looking at um, the, the wider benefits of SUDS, you know, what is the appropriate SUDS intervention in terms of new build, and in terms of retrofit and over the short, medium and longer term, um, which I think will be, uh, will, will be uh, interesting and interesting challenge too, because I suppose many of the, of the societal um, and socioeconomic benefits of SODs are quite difficult to measure, although it has been done internationally, but it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's one thing doing that for international research, but for the benefit of, of an NRA in particular, um, it's, uh, it's, quite a, it's quite a challenge. And we're looking to appro uh, propose appropriate SUD strategies um, to manage severe rainfall and change in clima climatic conditions. So it's not just SUDS components, but we're talking about SUD strategies in terms of the full SUDS system. Um, so in terms of our, our various tasks, um, we've, again, we've, we, s we split these up, um, but as one of the outputs will be, will be providing guidance for the selection of appropriate SUDS features so we're looking at uh, what we're calling the tr a transnational review of SUDS design criteria. So how is SUDS designed across Europe, across the various, various um, climate zones and underneath all the various governance structures and legislative uh, frameworks. Um, we're looking to provide guidance to establish the most appropriate SUDS features across the various climate zones um, in Europe. We know even in Ireland, some parts of Ireland are uh, annually uh, may get drier, some parts might get wetter, but we're certain that there will be more um, intense uh, rainfall events. So um, the current methods that we use to design SUDs, well, we need to change those, and traditional drainage systems also. So conveyance and storage capacity requirements for specific storm return periods in terms of SUDs. So in Ireland, um, I suppose it, it's safe to say that up to now, SODs has been traditionally used as a, uh, to, I suppose, to um, mitigate the effects of flooding or to combat flooding, whereas in, 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 in other parts of Europe, they see SODs as being a less powerful tool in terms of flood mitigation, and it's more to do with um, um, treating storm water. Of course, SODs provides benefit enhancements for, for both strategies, but um, the, the different perspectives are nonetheless interesting. So. Um, then we'll be looking to provide guidance for the selection and design of SUDS systems in new roads and SUDS retrofit. And this is probably um, a key one, in, you know, particularly in terms of SUDS retrofit. Um, there has been, and there certainly is a perception um, I suppose in the industry, it's, it's fair to say that, that you know, in terms of a drainage retrofit scheme, SUDS is probably by and large um, uh, the most uh, or the more expensive option. Now, people who would 
promote, so it would, would argue that that's not the case. Certainly, it, th that may be the case in urban environments, but again, it comes back to your cost-benefit analysis. What exactly um, are we looking at in terms of the benefits of subs, and how do we measure those? So we, the, the inputs um, uh, to, to answering these questions and providing the guidance, that comes from the listening process and the multi-criteria um, cost-benefit analysis that our partners in RODIS are undertaking. Um, and we're going to include uh, a methodology for data collection and assessment of existing drains infrastructure. Now, th that may sound like it's, uh, that's quite a, a simplistic approach, but I mean, so fundamentally, um, it comes down to, you know, for these approaches to work, um, all NRAs in Europe need to know what infrastructure they have and what the capacity of an infrastructure is. And that's what this, this uh, call is looking to respond to because we can make certain assumptions about weather patterns and, and, and our climate today, but in reality, what is the um, capacity of our drainage systems or what will they be in five, 10, 20 years time? And again, this is all going to feed in um, to uh, the manual, uh, which is being led by, uh, prepared by Aegis, um, which will also address the design and maintenance requirements of SUDs, again, which are very important. So it's interesting that a lot of the, the barriers that we were looking at in terms of SUDs implementation in Ireland are actually being, being addressed in this, in terms of, you know, uh, what are the benefits of SUDs? How can it be quantified? Um, uh, guidance for the design and maintenance of SUD systems and, and resilience to climate change. Um, so in terms of the challenges that we face in, in, in answering this, um, I suppose uh, one of the these are I suppose, the key ones here um, that we're aware of. Um, uh, SUDS policy it haven't been implemented uniformly across uh, uniformly across Europe. Um, the organisational and technical capacity within the NRAs differs. Um, there has been a, a focus on flooding um, because of the, the political consequences uh, arising from flood events is probably you know greater uh, than the environmental and, and socio-economic. Uh, challenges uh, uh, faced by pollution. Um, uh, education and public awareness programs are uh, paramount, and it's interesting some of the comments that we got from from NRAs in Europe on that. And this, you know, ultimately this calls for strong political commitment at at, at national and local level. Um, so the main deliverable uh, is is to develop a protocol uh, for adapting SUD systems to climate change. So we will have our draft ready in September. We're still on program for that, Albert, we're happy to say, uh, with the final report in March of next year. And uh, the inputs from other work packages uh, will, will feed into that. Um, so at the end of it all, there's going to be a manual. Uh, and the manual uh, is going to look at, um, um, I suppose, the, the following main headings. Um, so we're looking at, at all the drainage assets. Um, uh, you know, how resilient are they? Uh, are they to to climate change? So there's going to be a protocol for determining current and future function. Um, there'll be uh, uh, zonings uh, combining diagnostics and sensitivity of roads. So there'll be a hierarchy um, uh, and and various strategies uh, to deal with these uh, hierarchy of roads. Um, we want to uh, come up with measures um, to uh, result, I suppose, or, or, or that will give the NRAs uh, a more resilient drainage system. Um, and uh, as part of the how-to manual, uh, there'll be guidance on the, on the type of interventions and how often these interventions should take place. Um, we're mainly focusing on adaptation, but also some mitigation strategies. Um, and um, any additional uh, criteria that's required for the NRAs to update their standards, which I suppose is fundamentally what we're looking to do here. Um, so the main rules are, you know, the manual, uh, which we're all feeding into and combining the outputs of, of, the, of the other work packages. Um, uh, again, in terms of cost-benefit analysis, this is the work being undertaken by our uh, sister company, as I said, RODIS. So what is the best water management option? Um, uh, uh, for successful implementation of various project results. Um, so what we found, I suppose, from our initial um, tasks is really cost-benefit analysis isn't really used. Um, and, you know, there's no um, huge surprise for, for me as a, as a designer of these systems. Certainly costs 
Um, cost is always a, a factor, but in terms of the benefits of, um, you know, one, designing and constructing to combat climate change is the first thing. And then looking at the various options um, to combat uh, the effects of climate change over the short, medium and long term is something that we don't really do. Again, there are, um, as, as part of everyday practice, uh, we certainly produce cost estimates for, 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 uh, for road schemes and we're always looking to come up with, about, with the most um, uh, economic uh, design for our clients. Um, but we probably don't, it's pretty fair to say that we probably don't have a full understanding of the, um, uh, of the longer term um, benefits and challenges uh, faced by the, by the systems that we're currently um, designing and constructing uh, in our road infrastructure. Um, so in terms of the guideline development, there'll be a multi-criteria cost-benefit analysis approach which will cover the technical, environmental, societal um, aspects as well as durability, um, cost, and uh, I suppose fundamentally criticality. Um, so there are other, there are many other um, uh, projects that have addressed the same challenge in terms of cost-benefit analysis, and it's important that our methodology is consistent with them. Um, but at the same time, it needs to I suppose both build on what's been done before. Uh, be consistent with it, but um, uh, it should be clear in terms of how the various um, approaches uh, can be uh, can be adopted uh, when it comes to climate change um, adaptation strategies. So main challenges is compa compatibility with, with previous projects and current methods. I suppose it, it, we're, we have a clearer picture now of, of, of the existing methodologies used. Um, uh, there's a sister project, the detector project, which is also um, working on um, a, a separate um, uh, research project under the same call, um, and they're also doing a cost-benefit analysis. So we're we're um, approach, so we're liaising with them um, quite heavily to make sure that we have consistency. And uh, uh, you know, it's it's it may well be the case that previous uh, developed approaches, uh, you know, it may be that our current practices um, are not appropriate for water management. I mean, we we mentioned the arbitrary twenty percent um, that we that we add on to our flows and our streams and rivers for our for our culverts and to our rainfall intensities for our um, uh, features. Um, is that appropriate? Um, is it a case that? Uh, in some regions, we should actually be um, that there shouldn't be a climate change factor, and in other regions, it should be greater than the twenty percent. Um, you know, those are all issues that we're um, that we're going to address. Um, so the the main deliverable there is is a guideline for cost benefit analysis, uh, for um, adaptation and maintenance approaches uh, for water management, including um, including suds. And again, finally, at the end, um, it's fundamental you know for for these calls to be uh, to be implemented and adopted we need to show that they work um, so uh, there'll be demonstration of the watch results so there'll be various papers published and presentations given but also there'll be case studies um, that, that we will be looking to um, to use to show that the manual works in practice and how the manual would work in various scenarios um, so I um, I won't go into those in, in, in too much detail because I know we're, we're running out of time and I will go on to, uh, okay, summary of the main deliverables of the project. We have a country comparison report um, showing the various uh, state of practice across Europe. We'll be having guidelines for the application of, the, of climate information for all the climate analogues and, and uh, uh, climate change research or, um, that's been done uh, to date and, and, and which of um, approaches to use and how to use them um, and a protocol for SUDS um, uh, so how do we how do we design and how should we be designing SUDS uh, to combat um, the effects of climate change and guidelines for, for a cost benefit all culminating in a how-to manual which will inform designers and NRAs um, how to how to design operate and maintain um, these systems so some, I suppose, initial findings um, which are um, consistent with um, some of the findings that we found here and, and presented here uh, last year. So I suppose 
what we've what 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 we know so far, and it's probably no surprise uh, to some degree, but um, it's interesting to get a different perspective across Europe. Um, the single big biggest challenge facing the NRA is in relation to climate change is flooding. Um, flooding as a result of, of increasing um, uh, rainfall intensities. Um, second biggest challenge is legislation and compliance uh, with water framework directive and environmental impact assessments. Now, in Ireland, we, we've spoken about this before, we effectively our stormwater discharges are really, um, you know, aren't really licensed and only in, only in particular uh, circumstances do we actually know what the quality is of our stormwater discharge uh, into our streams and rivers. Um, but in some parts of Europe, there's actually legislation um, that's uh, I in terms of um, uh, the licensing of stormwater discharges, and there is a regulatory regime in place, uh, wi which, which we don't have uh, in this country. Um, pollution control, an interesting one. Some, uh, in some, um, some countries use grit um, when the roads are icy, and some countries use salt. Um, there's challenges, uh, there's, there's pros and cons to each, um, of those in, in, in terms of the, um, uh, of the harm it does to our drainage systems and the, and the environment. And of course, the, um, one of the key um, challenges is the uncertainties of climate change and um, the need for relevant legislation uh, or guidance was uh, pointed to by many of the NRAs, uh, particularly in terms of how to maintain uh, such systems. Um, so we asked um, the NRAs, um, so, you know, to what extent um, is SUD seen as a solution uh, to meeting these challenges? Um, and again, you know, it, it, it is a fundamental component um, of the approach, but um, the amount of space um, and land take um, is a big issue. Um, I see a colleague of mine, Thomas, is nodding there in the background. Um, but again, I think this may be where the cost-benefit analysis may actually have, um, have, have uh, uh, some sort of an impact um, in that, because we know, look at you know, land, some, sometimes land can be cheap, sometimes land can be very expensive. Um, and you know, we always try to buy as much land as we can within reason um, to, to provide uh, 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 an economic design for our clients, uh, but sometimes we, we often wish there was just a little bit more room within the red line boundary, um, uh, but that, that is certainly a challenge. Um, it's uh, in some countries, it's seen as being an, an integral part of roads design and has been uh, for years, so much so that they, they don't really have a name for it, they don't even call it SUDS, it's just part of, the, um, uh, of their approach. And in some of these countries, they're really looking to gain insights of, of, of the benefits of SUDS in terms of, uh, in terms of water quality, but also um, in terms of the impact um, that these systems can have um, on our aquifers and uh, water abstraction areas. Now, we know that it's, it, it, it can be very difficult in Ireland to get planning permission uh, for roads in particularly sensitive karst areas. Um, and uh, on, on, on one level, SUDS would seem to be the obvious um, solution uh, to that, but um, it, can be, it can be very difficult to uh, persuade some of the key stakeholders um, that, uh, of, of the benefits of SUDS, so the international perspective is actually uh, very interesting there. Um, the pollution rate uh, from roads may be too low uh, to determine a baseline for a comparison. That's quite interesting with traditional drainage structures. And the benefits of vegetated SUD systems um, is hard to quantify. Um, again, I suppose there has been um, a lack of, of, of research, particularly on, on those type of systems, but there is quite a bit of information out there. But um, across Europe, uh, we probably need to see more um, demonstration projects uh, and more licensing and, uh, and monitoring. And of course, there's the other benefits that some of the um, NRAs pointed to in terms of water quality, habitat, and immunity. Um, so uh, examples of successful SUDS features pointed to uh, ponds in urban areas, and they're cheap, and but more importantly, they raise public uh, awareness, um, which was seen as being a key component um, of, of, of SUDS promotion. And quite simply, it's a success if there's no flooding, um, but they also um, look attractive and they have a positive impact on water quality. Um, uh, 
uh, and uh, I suppose one of the um, uh, features of suds is you know they should be rustic, easy to use, easy to maintain, and multifunctional. And I think that's probably key to it. Um, we need to keep our drainage systems as as shallow uh, as we as we can, and and keep them visible. Um, again, in, in terms of responsibility for for maintenance, uh, it's a, uh, been recognised as a as a as a challenge here in Ireland too. Um, but across Europe, it tends to be um, local authorities um, uh, or a public works authority if it's, uh, if it's uh, a flood mitigation or amenity asset. Um, uh, but, in, uh, but that's not always the case. Um, uh, so the NRAs are responsible for suds that drain roads, uh, but it can be contracted out if quality standards are made available. Um, and in some jurisdictions, suds that serve public or private land can have maintenance contracted uh, out also. But really, it depends on the primary purpose um, of suds, which was, I suppose, interesting from, from an Irish perspective. So if it's for drainage or environmental quality or, um, or amenity, uh, different uh, authorities would have responsibility uh, for the sud system. Uh, so it's not as simple as just uh, as a function of where it's located. It's what is the purpose of the system. Uh, informs who is responsible to maintain it. Um, so suds failures um, in the past, um, storm storm flows exceed the capacity. Um, failure to inform the general public uh, of the purpose of suds is a big issue. I suppose if people aren't aware um, of what these systems are and they can look fairly innocuous, uh, a grass channel uh, to the untrained eye just looks like a, a grass verge. Um, um, you know, lack of maintenance can lead to clogging. Um, interesting, losses to ground can make some components, uh, some suds components unnecessary. I think one of the challenges that we face in this is looking at, you know, even, you know, our wetlands and our ponds um, and uh, how much, you know, how much water is lost to ground before it gets to the pond. Um, and, and sometimes uh, you know, we design and construct ponds, but they in inevitably end up turning into wetlands. That's also uh, a, a another feature of things. Um, porous asphalt, I mentioned that's very popular in, in some parts of Europe uh, where, where topography land is flat, um, and we, we don't have many, uh, as many uh, hills and valleys as we do here in Ireland, so, but porous asphalt, if it's not maintained uh, properly, uh, can fill and become clogged. And um, improper design of ponds uh, mean that plant life um, uh, can, can die off. Um, so lessons learned. Um, somewhat similar to our traditional drainage practices, but uh, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult um, to design for you know, low probability events. You know, the 500 year event effectively and onwards, is, it, it, it's, it, it's very difficult to establish what that actually is. Um, Public consultation must be integrated into the, into the design process. That was very interesting for me to hear um, from NRAs um, because one of the challenges that we would um, uh, say has been a key problem with um, SUDS um, implementation to date in Ireland has generally been that the general public are just unaware of what SUDS is and the benefits of SUDS. Um, so guidance and maintenance instructions are fundamental. Um, uh, what some people pointed to was that you know the the behaviour of these components could have been predicted with a better understanding of the underlying geology. So how you know uh, how we go about designing our sod systems, you know, I suppose as time goes on, our knowledge and understanding of these systems uh, evolves. We probably have a better understanding now, but. I suppose geology and hydrogeology is a key component of SUDS design, which in some respects makes it more complicated. But the traditional approach is actually, you know, fairly simple. We put everything into a pipe and bring it from point A to point B. But with the SUDS system, it's we're, we're designing a system uh, and a process. Um, and you know, uh, the best one: <laughs> simple solutions are always the best. And engineers, well, we're 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 prone to over designing things. Um, um, which is, may well be true. Um, 
but who is responsible for, for driving this sort of agenda, generally speaking, you know, and, and again, that varied within the various organizations, planning environmental groups within NRAs, uh, but also um, uh, in, some, in some jurisdictions, um, it was driven by, by central government um, and, uh, and legislation. Um, and just very quickly, to what extent across Europe um, is SUDS uh, performance monitored and recorded? Um, and unlike here, uh, it's recorded to ensure um, uh, discharges uh, meet the regulations in terms of quality and quantity. We certainly have that in terms of the um, foul and combined sewers, the agglomeration of slights by the EPA under uh, now with Irish water. But with, with storm water discharges, it's, it's not really the case. Um, quality checks can be limited to local authorities. Flooding is looked into when resources permit or when there is uh, a flood event. Um, and one of the, I suppose, the, <laughs> the issues that's been raised is that when you actually monitor, it usually means that there needs to be a design change somewhere, and that too can, can, can lead to um, uh, expense and call for greater investment. Just about got it within the hour, uh, so thanks very much. Um, and uh, I suppose we'll, we'll take any questions, um, if you have any. Um, well, I suppose I suppose it's both. Um, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to we're looking to I suppose come up with a manual that will inform um, engineers and the NRAs how drainage systems would should be designed, um, and and what are the most appropriate drainage systems, and and if that leads to a change in the design standards. Uh, so if there is a, uh, a move away from certain features or if there is more detail that needs to be put into the standards in terms of specifications, uh, for, for, for example, a simple one might be grass channels. You know, what should the makeup be um, within uh, or the subsoil or the subgrade within these grass channels? If um, the findings of this research um, point to uh, new thinking and new findings, well then, the results of the manual will be that NRAs will be updating uh, their standards. So the call isn't necessarily, you know, we're, we're not producing um, new standards at the end of it, but I suppose the idea would be that the NRAs uh, will look at uh, this manual and it will lead to a process where the standards are, are up, upgraded. Albert, do you have anything to well, add to that? Well, for me, there's, there's no, uh, no difference between a manual and
our planning process has to be somewhat evolved from the actual design that we need to do. And what we need to do is bring some of that into the planning process so that when we do have, when we are doing a, doing a, a, a detailed design, we've already made allowances for the fact that we might need extra land planted for, um, for drainage systems, like wetlands or ponds or grass or anything. Yeah, that's a good point. Quick question I think for me is that how are you going to implement that strategy? You mentioned planning. Does that depend on the project planning condition that, uh, I don't know, five percent of the drain from this stream should be exposed? Or because I can see from one of the photographs that you show on your concrete panel, it's a nice one, but that's a big grass, you know, huge area that you need to take as a cost. And I'm sure you were saying as well that you're going to be looking at cost benefits and everything. But at the moment, I think it's just cost anyway. And it costs more than a concrete panel. And everyone's going to go for concrete panel because it's less money. And how do you think well, I suppose it depends. Well, I suppose, you know, well, I suppose fundamentally, you know, um, uh, if you put in four or five kilometers of grass channel, do you need a pond at the end of that grass channel? You know, I suppose what we're looking to address here is one of the things that, you know, actually, what is the attenuation capacity of these grass channels um, uh, or, you know, grass channels generally? So I suppose there's, you know there there are many ways to design a sod system. Um, um, so you know we're we're trying to move away from pipes and channels with a pond at the end or a wetland. What we would like is uh, linear drainage features that um, provide attenuation and treatment throughout the process. And if it means that, you know, as as, as part of that, uh, if you, if you use grass channels. Um, you may not need a pond. If, if your pond is purely to provide attenuation, uh, that would be one of the, I suppose, the benefits um, of, uh, of using grass channels or, or swales. Um, I, 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 I suppose it's, it's benefits and everything. It, it's nice and everything. It's nice looking and everything. You know, but I'm just thinking how you're going to kind of force the design of structure. You, the channel is going to be there, but it doesn't mean that you're going to use it. Yeah, that's uh, correct. Because our experience is quite often, our experience is that it happens Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was actually mentioned by um by you know some of the um uh, people from from the UK authorities at our listening process, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right, you know, letting um agricultural lands flood, um. Um, I suppose in Ireland uh, we wouldn't uh, adopt that same approach, but I mean, I suppose it, 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 it really comes back to did these lands always flood or are you introducing um, more flooding than you did before and what is the value that you put on that um, is, is quite interesting in terms of how, how much compensation uh, do you need to pay um, these landowners um, uh, for that. Um, or subsidi or, or, or subsidies, yeah. So um, that that is quite um, an open question. But yeah, I know you're right. In, in in terms of letting agricultural lands flood and maybe flood a little bit more than did before, provided um, I think pollution um, is probably a bigger issue um, for them um, with that approach. Um, have there, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Flood, the Look, side, yeah, it's it, you know, uh, you know, effectively the whole you know one of the tenants of so is that you actually promote flooding and you promote ponding as part of the you know part of the feature. So yeah it is something that was mentioned in the listening process so we are um, uh, looking at that yeah. Uh, yeah. Just one question about the sorry on my back on terminology. Um, mm -hmm. the, there was a mention of um, surface area kind of models uh, mm -hmm. like uh, data flow and all these kind of like li LIDAR and um, like the hydrodynamic models used but it's mainly for surface flow like what mm. what 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 has been done or below the surface because the biggest thing now is you can control climate um, and you can you can manipulate the landscape whether it's natural or physical but what's done on the drainage side um, you know the land itself like if you just do you, do you mean the do you mean the the, the, the hydrogeology that yeah, sort of like Yeah. The the well, I think the, I think the problem there was karst actually. Um, that was in the, the, the yeah. The it was it was effectively groundwater flooding. I think that was um, uh, the issue there, and we have quite a lot of that in the west of Ireland. So, I think groundwater flooding, um, and again, that's something that we've you know that we've uh, looked at and and addressed. It's a particular problem uh, or, or karst um, aquifer is a particular challenge in Ireland. Um, not so much, certainly it is evident in parts of Europe, but not to the same extent um, as we have over here. But um, um, I, I don't know, does that, does, does that answer your question? But yeah, I mean, I mean look, you know, of course, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, well, well I, I, yeah, I think these were the, these, these, these are the models that were developed by JFlow, um, Albert, that I think he's talking, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it, it basically it, 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 it's pluvial and, flu and fluvial flooding is what they're um, is, is, is what the, those well, models are looking at. Is there anyone been out there to watch below or what's in the ground? Is there like mm -hmm. history is there what like integrated hacker models? Yeah, I mean they would be, um, and certainly there have been uh, quite a, a number of projects undertaken in Ireland, um, particularly uh, looking at that. Um, but I think I I in terms of our, our drainage design and the manual. Um, what we certainly will be looking at is, you know, in terms of the, the different um, geological features or different geological characteristics that are present. There will be, uh, you know, 
have, there'll have to be a menu of options that's available to you. Um, so certainly at the moment, you know, what the standards would say, you know, in, in karst features or in, in, in karst limestone, um, there's a, a preference, I suppose, for concrete channels and seal systems. However, international best practice would suggest that actually a sud system, uh, along rather than having a point discharge at the end somewhere, but having a, having a diffuse system throughout um, the catchment uh, and, and throughout the, um, if you like, across the aquifer, is the appropriate way to go. So all of those um, approaches are w will be will be looked at, um, and in the end, we'll have a nice manual. To look at all that. So you know, so you know Keith is actually head of the auditor for mm. the Yeah. Yeah, well, well, again, I suppose what we want to say, it comes back to, at the end, there's going to be a manual, uh, and that manual is to how, you know, how we design systems, um, uh, and, and, and one of those will be um, aquifer, you know, and geology. You actually mentioned the, the, the fact that we are obviously in the middle of the road, so the, the, the road is just complete. We don't have any limits for doing anything else, so if you were talking about designing a system that would make any limits, for example, where the environment Yeah, and I think that's an interesting point that you've raised, Albert, isn't, isn't it, you know, is that different countries, um, the NRAs operate differently. Um, and, and some are, are operate, if you like, in partnership with local authorities um, under, if you, like, you know, a regional governmental structure, um, you know, whereas in Ireland, you know, as a, as a contrast, the NRA is a, is a national body responsible for, uh, uh, for roles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on a catchment basis, yeah. 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 Right. Um, well, good. I'd like to thank my two children uh, for being fairly quiet at the back um, and for being my best supporters this evening. Thanks very much. Right. Th thank you.